The tracking can be broken down into two distinct areas. We have uh, track and sign identification, which, uh, as the name suggests, uh, drop-ins, footprints, uh, feeding sign, resting areas, all that sort of thing. And then trailing, which is actually trying to follow the animal um, to the point where you would catch up with it. And the applications for it in, uh, in the modern world, depending on where you are on the planet, um, vary. So in other parts of the world, tracking is used for search and rescue, for monitoring wildlife, um, for setting yourself up in a decent place if you want to photograph animals, just knowing that they're in a certain area, getting, uh, getting yourself downwind of that, uh, of, of that potential animal and just waiting may, may help you get a good shot. Sometimes just knowing uh, the, the broad differences between some of the family groups of animals and the droppings that they leave. So we've got essentially we've got things like carnivores which leave very distinct droppings, um, we've got um, herbivores which again will leave very distinct droppings and picking them up on the trail um, can help you obviously identify what animals are in your local patch. Some animals um, have a territory uh, that's active, actively defended and sometimes they'll use their droppings as part of that. So if you find droppings in a latrine sort of situation or high up on prominent places where the wind can obviously get under them, it's quite likely that they're being used for scent marking. So here we've got a fairly classic example of a badger latrine. Oftentimes, in fact most of the time, badgers will try and dig a, a hole and then they'll use that for their drop-ins. And they do become territorial and you'll often find them in big rows on the edges of, of territory. Um, I have occasionally found them in the middle of tracks where they've, uh, I like to think they've maybe got caught short and haven't had a chance to, to dig a hole. But one of the classic um, ID points is the fact that it is so sloppy because the amount of invertebrates and particularly worms they eat is the sloppiness. It does look, look just like mud. Um, and the smell is quite distinctive as well. It smells quite earthy and musky, unlike a fox, which in a fresh state would be, would be pretty horrendous to stick under your nose. Sometimes it doesn't look like they've dug a hole because they will keep using that same hole and you get this mound um, overflowing in effect and then they'll dig another. But they, they often re re frequent the same areas, which um, to my mind puts that as a, as a territorial marking. Other animals have what we would call a home range, so while they might, might well be in that area, they're not necessarily actively defending it. And that would vary um, within species of deer, within species of rodents, um, in all kinds of different ways. Roe deer, for example, are, are a territorial deer and they will leave their droppings in piles in little latrines um, along their trail. And that becomes a scent marker and obviously letting all, all the other roe deer in the area know that they're about. Fallow deer, on the other hand, will tend to drop them a little bit more randomly throughout the woodlands. We've got a handful of um, roe deer pellets. And roe deer ungulates, they do leave these little round ovoid pellets, often with a little, a little nipple at the end. And then we've also got some fallow deer. Now, both of these have dried out, so both of them are probably much smaller than you'd find them in reality. But you can see there's, there's going to be a huge crossover between a big roe deer and a small fallow deer. So sometimes location is, is the best clue that you've got to identifying the species. What classifies carnivore poo, and I've got a really good example here, but you can see there's this classic carnivore twist where the drop in itself twists round and round on itself. And you can see this is very full of fur. And the same thing happens in the UK with foxes. We have a stoat here, and we can see we've still got that classic twist so the reason that, that carnivores, um, their droppings are twisted, and I was told this by an American biologist and tracker, is that they're, uh, they're effectively trying to protect their gut from the bones and things that they eat. So the idea is that the bones are contained within that scat and the, the, um, the, the, the gut action twists the rest of the material around that to protect the intestinal wall. Cat droppings look slightly different. And if, you, um, if anybody's got a cat at home, you'll know it has a very rough tongue. What a cat will do is lick the meat off the bones and doesn't necessarily eat the bones. So this is lynx poo. Although it's still got this classic carnivore taper at the end and it's full of fur, it's more segmented and tends to drop out into little, little sausages. Not nearly as twisted because the gut doesn't need to twist to protect itself. People automatically think of birds as being the things that produce in pellets. So this is the uh, undigestible remains of the prey which goes part way down and then essentially gets regurgitated, so it's the bones and the feather and that sort of thing. But birds of prey, other than owls, frequently do it, seagulls, herons. In fact, it's thought that all birds are capable of producing pellets. So I've got some tawny owl and some barn owl pellets here, and I think the real distinction, uh, we have this sort of amorphous mass um, that doesn't look 
um, particularly twisted or, or segmented in any in any kind of coherent way. And then this just scales up. So we've got things like um, like our barn owls and our tawny owls, right up to this one, which is a European eagle owl. So the size of these guys just reflect the size of the animal that it came from. It's not uncommon that you would find a rare species in your region, but it's quite easy to look at the local distribution maps and suss out what you're likely to find before you even start looking. And obviously if you come across a footprint or, or a drop-in or any animal sign, then knowing what it's likely to be uh, eliminates quite a lot of stuff. The content of the drop-in is also going to vary greatly, not just between species, but season to season, depending very much on diet. This is a badger drop-in. and the bulk of a badger's diet generally, I think they, think they, um, they reckon about 70% is, uh, is invertebrates, particularly earthworms. So generally what happens with a badger drop-in is it's, it's usually a splat. It's very, very muddy and it smells quite earthy as well. And smell can be another clue because fox um, scat does smell quite strong, um, as do most carnivores to be honest. It's all part of that scenting as well as, as, well as what they're eating. So this one um, has been eating a little bit more of a solid diet and sometimes in very hot summers when badgers are unable to get down and get worms, they will raid, raid um, grain bins and you can, you can find these in their latrines because they nearly always dig a little hole um, to put droppings into and they look like little tiny granola bars, uh, nothing like this. This is a set of fox droppings throughout the season. So we've got one here that's full of of rabbit fur, so that's quite likely to be a winter drop-in. Could also be in, in the early spring when there's lots of young, uh, vulnerable, naive rabbits that are easy to catch. If we go to this guy here, we've got, I don't know whether you can pick up on this, but we've got lots and lots and lots of beetle casings in there. And it's amazing how, how many insects that a fox will eat as well. So that's likely to be a bit later on in the summer where it's eaten a lot of invertebrates. And then again, we've got another fox drop-in here that's pretty well full of bramble seeds. And people don't always appreciate, but foxes do eat a lot of fruit when they get a chance. It's quite a romantic story, this. This is a um, Iberian wolf scat. So it's a European wolf. And um, on my honeymoon, I, uh, we, we went uh, to Portugal on a wolf watching and horse riding holiday. And I managed to find some of this and dried it uh, on the apartment radiator, which um, hopefully this will now become one of our family heirlooms, I don't know.